So um, <clears throat> my goal in this part, um, this will be a, a little bit more mathy, um, but, but not the mathiest. That will be the last part for the really brave. Um, my goal is to tell you a little bit about this uh, beautiful technique that's called arithmetization that actually underlies all of the efficient and deployed uh, zero-knowledge proof systems that are out there. So Ligero, the ones based on bilinear pairings, uh, you know, definitely Starks and Snarks, they all involve arithmetization. And then there's a point where they sort of differ. So the main point of this talk is to show you how arithmetization helps with scalability. I won't talk about how it helps with privacy, I'll hint at it, but I want to tell you why or show you why arithmetization helps with uh, scalability. That's the main point. So it's all about getting succinct proofs and succinct verification time. So the goal is we're given a general program, an input, and a time bound, and Bob claims that the program on the input and auxiliary input, which may be private, reaches a certain output after t steps. Okay? And we want to build a system where truisms can be proved and verified efficiently and falsities are going to be rejected. So we would like this proof system to have uh, the property, first of all, of being a proof system, of be, uh, allowing us to enforce and check integrity, correctness of the st system. We want it to be zero knowledge. We would like to, to, prevent privacy, uh, to prevent knowledge about the auxiliary inputs from being leaked. We want it to be succinct. That's the focus of... of uh, our discussion here. We want it to be verifiable in polylog time in T. T is the time bound. And uh, auxiliary uh, piece of information that I won't talk about, we would like it to be proof of knowledge. Does Bob actually know a witness or he just maybe he's just cheating and he just knows that some witness exists? Okay? And this is, of course, a special case of a problem of checking membership in a non-deterministic language, okay? And this particular language, it's uh, complete for non-deterministic exponential time. It goes under the name the universal language. I like to call it the computational integrity language. It has other names, but it's this very general setting that uh, captures a lot of interesting cases. So what is arithmetization? Arithmetization is a general technique of reducing problems about computation, like, uh, you know, is X a member of a, of a of certain language? It just mentions computation. You think about a program or a Turing machine or a circuit. So that's the start point of the arithmetization, arithmetization reduction. The end point is a set of questions about algebraic error correcting codes and about polynomials and algebra. Okay, so that's arithmetization. It takes computational problems and transfers them to the world of algebra. Uh, for instance, questions like, is f, a function f, uh, the evaluation of some degree d polynomial? That's the nature of the reduction. And a brief history, so Gödel's incompleteness theorem and proof famously already used uh, an encoding of computation in terms of natural numbers. Uh, the version that we're talking about was introduced more recently by Rasborov to prove circuit lower bounds, uh, famously. And then it was quickly introduced into the world of interactive proof systems in, in work by Lund, Karloff, uh, Fortnau, Nissan. Um, and ever since then, it, it has stayed and played a central role in all interactive proof systems or in many versions of them, and also in secure multi-party computation and a lot of cryptography. So why? Why, you know, if you want to generate an efficient zero-knowledge proof, what does it have to do with polynomials, right? It's kind of mysterious. So I, I want to start with some, some intuition. So encodings of, or evaluations of polynomials happen to um, be a special family of error-correcting codes. And error-correcting codes are this method of adding redundancy to information. They were originally introduced in the 1940s by Shannon, Hamming, Hadamard, others, in order to deal with uh, digital communication over, you know, over 
the ether um, and, and deal with noise that, that appears there. And then um, they got sort of rebranded in computational complexity for the purposes that we'll talk about today. So polynomials and all of these algebraic codes allow us to add redundancy and spread information. So in the context of communication, what you want to prevent, you have a certain word that is encoded by bits, and you would like to transmit these bits or maybe save them on some magnetic tape, and then you want uh, to be able to recover the original meaning. Now the problem is that if a single bit is, is deleted or uh, changed, then maybe the meaning has completely changed. So an error correcting code adds redundancy, and now it just magically happens that a single bit being erased or changed doesn't um, change the meaning of the information because you can sort of decode and find out what the original message was. So that was the original purpose. Now in the context of computation, this sort of adding of information is used to prevent the following situation. I would like to cheat about a computation. So I would like to start from a certain point and claim that I reached a point that is favorable to me. And the way I'll do it is I'll find a single place in the computation and change a single bit. And I hope that no one will notice. So indeed, if I don't use any error correcting codes, I might get away. Or rather, if you want to be able to check that I wasn't cheating, you need to check every and each step of the computation. Error correcting codes allow adding a whole lot of redundancy, and then if I change just one bit in an encoding, I haven't really changed the information. And a different way to view it is that if I try to cheat with error correcting codes, then there'll be a whole lot of uh, problems in consistency and interconsistency between different parts of the information I'm, I'm sending. So another good analogy in the context of uh, proofs is you know, consider a, a person standing on trial uh, being, let's say, blamed for, for, for some crime, for, for theft, theft. And suppose that person says, um, you know, on the day of the crime, I was in a different country. Now consider the two cases of a truism and a falsity. So a person who speaks the truth uh, could easily, in the examination process, which is an interactive process, that you could think of it a little bit as a proof system, um, you know, the other side is making all kinds of questions. Oh, what airline did you take? What was the weather that day in the place? Uh, you know, let's open some uh, security camera that was close to the hotel. Can we see uh, your image there? And reality has all of these cross consistencies that if you're speaking the truth, they all will fit in together. And if you're lying, um, so the theory goes, there'll be a lot of uh, problems in your story. And this allows the examiner to succinctly catch uh, s some problem in, in, in the story, right? So, and, and the examiner can do it very succinctly, right? Without going through every and each second of the, you know, the day of that person. Now, in the computational world, we want to reach a situation that is like physical reality, where all these security check cameras and, you know, different little bits that are all connected to each other. Now, a computation is something that is very, very compressed and, and efficient, so you don't have it. The error correcting codes add all of this redundancy and ability to sort of check things across each other. So that's some intuition as to why arithmetization or error correcting codes help, right? But it's still very magical. Okay, so a little bit more about details. So the TLDR of this talk is that arithmetization, the reduction of computation to problems about polynomials, can help you with dealing with succinctness and also dealing with zero knowledge. But my focus is going to be mostly on just the succinctness aspect. I'll say a little bit about the zero knowledge. And we're going to work in the IOP model that I previously introduced. So we assume that we can ask a prover to give us Oracle access to a certain function, and then we can query that function at random location, and we can tell the prover, OK, leave this function here, and now I'm sending more randomness. Please give me another evaluation of some other function. And then let's do it again and again, and then I can query each one of these functions at random locations, okay? That's the mental model we're working in. Not the mental, the mathematical model we're, we're working in. And the communication complexity is only the number of queries that are actually read from these various uh, oracles, okay? And please uh, interrupt me with questions if anything is not clear. Good.
So what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a, a few very useful facts about polynomials, and then we'll see how these facts can be brought together to let you check correctness very succinctly. So the first fact is the following. If H is a subgroup of a field, and its size is little h, then the polynomial whose roots are all elements of the group is a very succinct polynomial, right? It is the polynomial x to the power h minus 1. Why? Because if the field has order h, every element in it, if you raise it to power h, it is the identity. This is either Lagrange or, you know, follows from one of the basic theorems of group theory. So, this is a proof that the polynomial of degree h, which is x to the h minus 1, it can have at most h roots, and we just accounted for all of them. So this is the polynomial that vanishes on those places. It is very succinct. So you have a very succinct representation of a rather large group of roots. And you can evaluate this polynomial on any point in the logarithm of the size of the group, many operations, by repeated squaring. So this logarithmic evaluation of this polynomial is going to be crucially used in improving succinctness and getting succinct proofs. The second fact is that a, poly a polynomial vanishes on the point gamma if and only if there exists some other polynomial such that this other polynomial has degree exactly one less than p and p equals x minus gamma times p tilde of x. This is another basic fact about polynomials, right? If something is a root if and only if x minus that root divides the polynomial. And if you do this inductively for a whole lot of polynomials, you get that p of x vanishes on the subgroup h if and only if there is an auxiliary polynomial, p tilde, that is of degree, degree of p minus the size of the group, such that if you take the vanishing polynomial um, of the group H and uh, multiply it by P tilde of X, you get P of X. That's another fact with a very simple um, proof. And the third fact, for now we're going to use three facts and later on we're going to introduce the fourth fact, is that two distinct polynomials of degree T, that they are distinct, they're not the same one, they can intersect at at most D points, uh, for uh, example, two lines intersect at most at one point, two parabolas intersect at most at two points, so on. So if you take two functions that are evaluations of distinct degree d polynomials and evaluate them at 100 times the degree many points, you will get two evaluation tables that are very far. They're 99% far from one another in relative distance. Okay? And this is the error correcting code that is known as the Reed-Solomon error correcting code, was introduced in the 1960s uh, to deal with information, uh, you know, found its way in CDs and DVDs in the 1990s, and I don't know if it's still used, but uh, Starks use, uses it a lot. Okay, so three facts. Let's just uh, compress them. Let's now use them to check something succinctly. Succinctly means logarithmically, in the amount of information being checked. So, first of all, we're going to make a, an assumption, and this assumption will be dealt with in the very last talk. The assumption is that we have some magical way for forcing the prover to use only degree d polynomials in the IOP model. So we allow the prover to pick any degree d polynomial that they choose, but they must commit to some degree d polynomial and write it down, and they cannot change it later on. Okay, and suppose we have some magical method for doing this. So here's a challenge. Given a function that we have Oracle access to in the interactive Oracle proof model, that we know its degree to be less than d, and d is less than 1 over 100, it's like less than 1% the size of the field. I'm asking you to devise a protocol for checking succinctly and with very small error if f vanishes on all points in H. Now, D can be much greater than H. So, I mean, it's not necessarily the zero polynomial. I want to know if this polynomial vanishes on um, all, 
of these points in H. So, what do you suggest the protocol be? You know what, I'll throw the first suggestion and then I'm asking you why is this a bad idea. Um, let's read each input, let's query F at all points in H and check if they are zero. Is this a good idea? Why is it not a good idea? What's the problem with it? What? It's not succinct. The number of queries I need to make is the size of the group. Okay, wait, let me do another, another suggestion and let, you know, correct me, uh, tell me why this is not a good idea. I will sample um, a random element from H and I will query F at that point and see if it's zero. Is this a good idea? So now it's very succinct, it's one query, I just need to see if it's zero. What's the problem with this thing? Yes? It has, why does it have high error? Almost. The claim, that it, the claim that we want to check is that on every point in H, the polynomial vanishes. So if there's even one single point on which F does not vanish, the claim is already wrong. So a malicious uh, prover could give the evaluation of some polynomial that is zero everywhere but for a single point in H. And now uh, the answer given here is, a, is, is correct because my likelihood of finding out that the claim is wrong is the number, is the fraction of non-zero entries in H and it could be as small as one over H. So that's, that's, that's not, okay, so I already gave two bad suggestions. Um, now let's hear, uh, are there any other suggestions? Yes. Okay, polynomial division or Euclidean division. So what is the protocol that you suggest? That's, that's, that's the direction. What do you suggest? Very good. So try to divide F by ZH and see if the remainder is, uh, like if there's no remainder. Okay, so is this uh, succinct as a procedure? Succinct means something that is logarithmic in the size of H. It is not succinct because a degree D polynomial, and D is greater than H, in order to even find it, it has D coefficients. And, you know, you can interpolate if you read D entries but D is greater than H. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very good suggestion, it's in the right direction, but I'll give you a hint. You are allowed to ask um, the prover to write down some oracle or oracles. That doesn't cost you anything. You're only charged for the queries into the various oracles. And look at the three facts above. Points of H vanish on the polynomial F. So this is uh, the second suggestion that I made, and it, 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 it does work, it's succinct, but it is not sound, because maybe, maybe uh, the polynomial F vanishes on all but a single point in H. So the hint is, yeah, you're, okay, yes. Deg P minus H is a very good suggestion, but random hint, Ask the prover for more. What are you going to ask the prover for? Look at fact uh, number two. Ask him to evaluate which, which function. F is already, let's suppose it's already evaluated on all of the field. So if you have access to all of the information, what are you going to ask the prover to evaluate? Very good. So look here. This says that P, suppose now that P is the polynomial that is supposed that F is its evaluation. It vanishes on H if and only if there exists some other polynomial of degree D minus H such that this relation holds for polynomials. So here's the solution. We ask the prover, evaluate some function G, but just make sure that it is of degree D minus little h. Pick whatever you want. Now we have two polynomials to query from. So here's what we do, sorry. We sample a single point, alpha, and we accept if and only if, basically the relation that we suppose should happen does indeed happen for alpha. 
So it's very succinct as a protocol. Let's now analyze the complexity. We make two queries, one to f, one to g. To compute, we pay O of log h, and that is, why do we pay O of log h uh, arithmetic steps? To compute zh, very good. We need to compute zh on the, so here we just get a field element, and this we get a field element, but this we need to compute on our own. Now luckily, z of h is of high degree, but it's very succinct. So we, by repeated squaring, we can verify, we can compute it in log h steps. And, okay, what about completeness? So if f indeed vanishes, what will the good prover give us? If f vanishes on h, then this fact says that there must exist such a p tilde, so the prover will just evaluate it. And then this will hold, this relation will hold with probability 1. And if not, if this doesn't occur, right, we look at the other side. We know that for any polynomial p delta of this degree, it is not the case that, this, that we have an equality. So if we subtract one side from the other, we get a non-zero polynomial that has at most its degree many roots. But we are sampling from a domain that is much larger. It is 100 times larger. So the probability of error, it's one-sided error, is less than 1%. Now I just want to pause and appreciate the amazing fact that went on here. We just verified some statement about H constraints by only paying a price of log H arithmetic complexity in two queries. This is how you get succinctness from arithmetization. Now, you might say, and you'll be right, that this is not a very interesting case because, you know, who cares about whether f is all zero on h? So let's go for something a little bit more interesting. Suppose now, again, the prover uses only degree d polynomials. Here's a second challenge. And this is now already a little bit closer to something that might arise in a computational integrity statement. Now, the prover claims that f is Boolean on H. What does it mean? It takes only value 0 or 1. But it's not the all zero function. It could be something else. Actually, there are two to the end different functions it could be that are legitimate. How do you know that the verifier is indeed... This is sort of a type checking problem, right? We want to know that the type of F on H is always Boolean. So, what do you think the protocol should be? It should have uh, X times x minus 1 is very good, it will show up here, but how would you, how would you use x times, so the polynomial x times x minus 1 is the unique monic degree 2 polynomial that has exactly two roots that are 0 and 1. So it is the polynomial that vanishes on exactly two inputs, 0 and 1. How are we going to use it to reduce this problem to basically the previous problem? you can compose with, with that polynomial. So let's see, how would, are we going to compose? So once again, we'll ask the prover to send a function g. This time, we're going to allow the degree to be slightly, slightly larger. 2d minus h, not d minus h, 2d minus h. And now we're going to check a new relation that is a little bit more elaborate. So you see, this is the polynomial x times x minus 1. We will plug f of alpha for random alpha into this polynomial that has exactly two roots, 0 and 1. And now we notice that this thing is 0 if and only if um, either f of alpha is 0 or f of alpha is 1. So, but what we do is we plug this constraint into a general alpha that is not necessarily inside the domain H. It could be anywhere in the field. And we check this relation. We check that f of alpha times f of alpha minus 1 equals zh of alpha times g of alpha. Now, the complexity is still two queries. We still pay only O of log H uh, uh, complexity 
in order to, it's the, for the same reason, we just need to check, you know, compute ZH of alpha. And now the error probability went up to 2%. Why? Because both polynomials now are actually of degree 2D. Right? This polynomial is, a, we plugged, we take f of alpha of degree d and multiply it by another polynomial of degree d. And here we anyways allow this to be of polynomial. This is 2d minus h plus degree h. So we have a polynomial of degree 2d, um, which if the statement is false, the probability of error is smaller than 2%. Question so far? So notice we still have succinctness, but we went a little step further towards checking general statements of computational integrity. Good. Now, the last example I want to discuss will be much more complicated. This will already be a serious computation. This will be the uh, Fibonacci sequence. But before that, um, we need one more fact. And that's the fact that the degree of a polynomial remains invariant under a linear transformation applied to its input. So the degree of f is the same, the degree of f of x is the same as the degree of f of a of x plus b. Okay? For any a that is non-zero and b. What happens if a is zero? Only one side holds because this becomes f at a constant function, it's a constant uh, polynomial, so it's degree zero. But if a is not zero, this equality holds. <coughs> and we need this fact for the very last example that will deal with a general purpose computation. So we have our fourth fact here, and we need to use it. So given a function f, we would like to find whether f evaluates the Fibonacci sequence on H, where the Fibonacci sequence is taken modulo P, and we're working inside the field FP. So you, you remember the Fibonacci sequence. It starts with one, one, then you sum up those two and you get two. You always, to get the next element, you sum the two last ones, and you continue this way. So <coughs> the statement here is that the very last element, when you evaluate it on, on you know, size H many points, um, will be the element B, let's say 57. Okay, someone wants to prove this to you. Now the obvious way to do it is to run the computation, but we want to verify it succinctly without running the computation. So here's the protocol. The verifier asks for two auxiliary functions, G and G prime. They're both of them going to be these uh, quotients or residues from division by vanishing polynomials. One of them is of degree d minus h, the other one is of degree d minus 3. I just want to point out that we have two different things we have to deal with. We have to deal with boundary constraints. We want the very first two elements to be 1 and 1, and the last one to equal b. And for all other cases, we would like an element to equal the sum of the prior two elements, right? So we have two types of constraints. We have a transition function applied time and again, but we also have the boundary constraints, that at the beginning we start with 1, 1, and we end with b. And because of this, we need two different polynomials, g and g prime. One we'll, we, we will use to check the uh, transition function, and the other one we will use for the boundary constraints. Good, so now for the boundary constraints, we need two polynomials. First of all, we need the polynomial that um, ev you know, evaluates to one on the first point, and to one on the second point, and to b on the last point. So we suppose that, we assume that omega generates the multiplicative group h. So it's a fixed polynomial of degree, um, degree two. And then there's this other polynomial that is like ZH. It is the polynomial that vanishes on these three points. One, omega, on the very first two elements in the group and the last element in the group. So, and this is the test that we do. We sample some alpha in all of F, but for two elements, one and omega, because we don't want to deal with division by zero. And then we check two constraints. First of all, we check the transition function. We check that the value um, at point alpha 
is the sum of the previous two elements. So it's the value at point alpha divided by omega, which is the previous element, and at point alpha divided by omega squared, which is two elements before. And we check that this thing equals zh of alpha times g of alpha divided by these two points, alpha minus 1, alpha minus omega. So what we're doing here is we're essentially saying we need to check this constraint on all entries but for the first uh, two constraints. Uh, the first two points, we don't want to check this transition relation because we know they are one and one, but from the third one and onwards, we need to check this thing. And that's what this constraint checks. And the second constraint checks that f of alpha minus b of alpha, if we subtract this degree two polynomial, we should get something that vanishes on d. So it turns out that these two constraints are exactly what capture the boundary constraints of the Fibonacci sequence and the transition function of the Fibonacci sequence. And let's look about succinctness. To verify these constraints, we sampled one a point and we make five queries, right? We make a query to f of alpha, f of alpha over omega, f of alpha omega squared, g of alpha, and g prime of alpha. We make five queries and we need to evaluate several simple polynomials like zh of alpha, zh, which is easy to evaluate, and then we need to evaluate uh, d of alpha and b of alpha, which are constant degree polynomials. So the arithmetic complexity is still logarithmic in h, and now we've already succinctly verified a very large computation without unrolling and checking all parts of it. And by the same reasoning as before, um, in the good case, uh, the probability of acceptance is 1. And in the bad case, the probability of uh, acceptance is at most, I guess, 2% as well, or even 1%, by the same reasoning as before. So th no, that's what you want to verify. Someone is making the claim. You are only given, someone wants to make, here's a claim of computational integrity. The claim is, you know what? The hth element of the Fibonacci sequence mod p is 57. Maybe I'm cheating. You want to be able to verify this without uh, needing to do the computation and without trusting me. This is a method that allows you to do it, okay? So the general theme is that you take a computation and you convert it into two kinds of constraints, into a set of constraints that tracks the correctness of the transition function, that if you go from a certain state to the next state, you're doing it correctly. So in the case of Fibonacci, it was one constraint that is linear, but for a general computation, this constraint would be much more involved and, and involve many variables and check many things. And the second kind of constraints, the simpler kind, is getting boundary constraints or constraints for the boundary conditions of the computation, the input and the output. And then you check that it applied to f and that all constraints vanish on h by this division um, by fact number 2. Now, as I said, I'm not, I, I, I wasn't going to talk about zero knowledge. I just want to say, let me just, how much time do I have? What's the time now? Five. Okay, so in one, in one uh, just uh, like two bullets about how do you get zero knowledge, right? If you g allow the verifier to query f restricted to h, basically you see all parts of the computation. So the trick is to first of all never sample from h, just sample from other areas and to slacken the degree requirement a little bit. So if you know that you need to make, to allow the verifier Q queries, you allow the prover to work with degree D plus Q. And the prover will use this slackness factor of Q to do an analog of Shamil's secret sharing and sort of add in a little bit of randomness so that the actual answers that the verifier reads are just completely uniformly random. Completely uniformly random. And this actually gives you perfect zero knowledge. Perfect zero knowledge. And it's actually even relatively easy to prove that you get this. So you get both succinctness and privacy from arithmetization, which is what we wanted to show. So 
We saw that arithmetization solves succinct checking of computational integrity. I told you, you know, hand wave, that adding randomness and increasing the degree also gives you even perfect zero knowledge, along with the succinctness. And what we didn't see is how do we back this assumption that f and g are of exactly the degree we wanted, and no more. And this will be the part that we deal with in the proximity uh, protocols that will be the very last part of, uh, of this, you know, of my series of lectures. I just want to say that here is where, this is the point where, um, you know, Starks and Snarks differ. So you could use the linear PCP techniques and, you know, then a whole lot of other stuff like bilinear pairings and so on. To, you, you still use arithmetization for a very long while, but then you say, well, remember that we needed to sample this point alpha? Let's find a clever way to hide from the prover the point we're asking him about, this alpha. So that's one approach, and that's how you get to, for instance, the ZK snarks in, in Zcash. And the toxic waste, actually, or the trapdoor that, that is problematic, is exactly this value of alpha. If you know what alpha is, then the whole system is broken. And the other approach, the approach of PCPs, uh, that also is used in, in Starks, follows this thing. You say, you tell the prover, please commit to the function, evaluated on many points. And after you committed, we're going to ask you some queries, and we're going to apply extra machinery called low degree testing or proximity testing to sh ensure that the functions f and g that you gave us are low degree. So those are the two uh, routes that you can take, uh, I mean, two of the routes that you can take to deal with this problem. Um, you know, Starks does it the second way. Um, the first way requires some trusted setup and things like that. The other one is transparent, only uses public randomness. Um, I'll repeat it again. We'll be running a workshop on it. Please sign up. And if you want to realize this in practice, write us, uh, you know, jobs at Starkware. Uh, so this concludes the third of four parts, and the last part will deal with proximity testing for the Reed-Solomon code.